Dear viewers, this is our weekly program, Diplomacy Among the World, the by our host and producing this program for you. My guest today is Dr. Thomas Hawasafa. He's a world winner with a resource expert. I'm going to have a Zoom meeting, especially with Dr. Thomas Hawasafa, and we'll talk about, especially about technical matters on the ground, each of our wins and stuff. Okay. Dr. Many thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Well, just to begin with, what is the primary objective of the Grand Ethiopia of Awareness and Sudan? Is that to harm or to benefit the downstream countries? The primary objective of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam is energy production. Um, and that would lift uh, an estimated 65 million Ethiopian literally from darkness. Uh, there are so many extra benefits because of electricity from uh, economy-wide impact, healthcare. In fact, most of the uh, development goals that are you know, put forward by many organizations uh, could potentially be met by uh, GERD uh, energy production. Um, there is no, I cannot say there is no harm at all, but there will be, the question is whether there is significant impact to downstream uh, countries and there is no significant impact to downstream. Uh, the only change that could come is during the filling and once the dam is filled, uh, whatever water comes in will produce energy and goes to downstream uh, uh, country. So uh, in that sense, it's a win-win for both Ethiopia and the neighboring countries as well, and also the two downstream countries. Well, since 2012, the Sudan, Egypt, and Ethiopia were in a round of discussion to solve the dispute on the ground of awareness and Sudan, but have no agreement or not, not reach an, on an agreement still. What's the problem behind this? Yeah, the main issue, as far as I can tell, is uh, GERD, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is a single project on a single basin. Um, is being used by the two downstream countries, uh, Sudan and, and Egypt, as a water sharing instrument. Um, so some of the proposal that put forward for a negotiation and agreement and ultimately signing that document um, has direct implication on how any water, conceptive water use in the future by Ethiopia. Uh, so the main issue that they cannot get into agreement is uh, the water, basically water allocation. So if they put aside uh, that work, water allocation, um, I believe they can reach um, easy to uh, an agreement. Well, that's uh, the second feeling of water operation. It's operation can have its own negative impact on the downstream countries. The second uh, feeling which Ethiopia plans to do this uh, summer, um, there isn't really any impact and that's for several reasons. Uh, the first one is the amount being retained or at least planned to be retained this summer, 13.5 uh, uh, billion cubic meter. Uh -huh. That's less than 20% of the Blue Nile flow today. I'm not talking about the long-term average, but where we are today. And then if we look at uh, overall the Blue Nile, it's less than 15%. Uh, that's because we have excellent uh, hydrologic condition this year, and we expect even uh, for the next summer as well. That's for one. For second, they have already agreed through their 2015 Declaration of Principles signed by the three countries uh, that explicitly says that construction and filling will go hand in hand. Um, so the typical uh, dam construction would have you finish the dam and fill it. That could have be actually bad in this case because you need a lot of water, but GERD is smart in a sense that you continue to uh, construct and then you continue to fill the dam. So this summer um, water, the 13.5 as part of the construction is already agreed on that document. Uh, that's the second point. The third point is that we have excellent hydrologic condition today. Um, I would say probably ever. The reason is we just passed through a once in a hundred year flood, a lot of water last year, and the expectation are to continue for that. And last year, uh, when I'm, while I'm feeling sorry for our brothers, sisters in Sudan because of the flood, but Egypt was able to uh, store a lot of water. And uh, currently, we have seen, in fact, uh, that the storage in Aswan High Dam for this time of the year 
is the highest it has been in 30 years, 30 years. Um, and uh, the fourth one will be that we don't expect uh, any drought or even less, uh, less than normal hydrologic condition this summer. Things are looking good. Uh, the recent projection from, uh, you know, uh, International Research Institute from Columbia University, uh, they do this work for the entire globe, basically. If you look at the Africa, uh, Nile Basin, including uh, Ethiopia, uh, Sudan, and so on, uh, you, you, the, the expectations are really, uh, really very good hydrologic conditions. So for all this reason, um, I don't think this second feeling um, is going to impact downstream countries. That looks like they have been, you know, they, they make it to, to look like it's a big impact, but we don't see uh, from hydrologic perspective. Well, once this uh, project is fully completed and started rendering service, what is the advantage of the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam for the downstream countries? It has a uh, very, uh, it has a lot of benefit for not only for Ethiopia, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, electric generation and economy wide, but both for Sudan and Egypt. Um, in fact, a recent study uh, that came out, we ha I have seen uh, for Sudan, and this probably is the first time they look at not just simply one reason of the Grand Renaissance Dam, whether it increased hydropower or whether it increased agriculture, but they looked at the entire economy-wide um, advantage because of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. So what they found uh, was that from today all the way uh, 40 years, uh, they will have an increased GDP uh, from anywhere between 47 to 83 billion uh, dollars. Uh, that means the Sudan's economy is projected to grow by one to two billion per year because of the Renaissance Dam. And this is only from uh, increased agriculture because the dam regulate flow and they will have year round, probably two, three uh, crop cycle, and then also increased production because the water regulated, regulated water will allow them to produce anywhere between 20 to 40% uh, percent increase in electric production. And this is not even accounting for uh, the damage from flood, how much you would save otherwise. Uh, we know what happened last year. Unfortunately, more than 100 people died. Um, economic uh, impact was in hundreds of million. Um, and some of the other issues, including the, the uh, water quality and uh, the, the sediment without increasing all this, uh, including all this, just from um, electric increased electric production and agriculture would impact Sudan's GDP by one to two billion. For Egypt, it's an extra storage, basically, that would be used during drought. Many people uh, may not uh, pay attention to this is uh, that, in fact, in future climate change, uh, what we see and what the models say is in, uh, there is in increased temperature. At the same time, there is variability in water uh, uh, in terms of how it comes, the season, the shift, and so on. So and in the future, in fact, most of the studies shows that it, you are better off as a Nile Basin storing the water in a cooler uh, place like Ethiopia. Nowadays, Egypt is worrying about the droughts. How does the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam impact the Nile Basin? Drought is, uh, is very interesting. I, I know that in their negotiation and some of the uh, draft agreement, they put uh, all kinds of uh, drought scenarios. Uh, we are not currently in drought, uh, but it is true that at some point in the future, uh, which nobody knows, maybe 10 years, 20 years from now, there will be a time that we will be in drought. Um, and then at that time, what do you do? I think this is where that's where one of the sticky points uh, that you asked me earlier, that holding them, how do you, do you uh, agree on this? The way to handle drought is not to put it um, just only for one country. I think that's what Sudan and, and uh, Egypt are trying to do. Um, what you need to do is that you first have an allocation of your water, um, you know your allocation, and then also you should share the drought as well. Um, there is a great example with Colorado River Basin. Most people, they know that uh, in this specific case for drought, there is actually a very interesting thing going on now, today. 
this, this time. So as you know, Colorado River Basin is allocated. They have shares between up, upstream state and downstream state and Mexico. So what they have done several years back is if a drought comes, how do we share the drought itself? So in 2019, they came up with this idea of what they call drought contingency plan and they allocate based on a specific storage in the basin, how do they share the drought? In fact, for the first time ever in their history, they will probably execute this drought sharing mechanism this summer, depending on how low Lake Mead, that's the biggest reservoir in Colorado River, one of the two uh, there. So to me, drought, the way you handle is not by just putting it on the shoulder of one country, in this case, Ethiopia, they should share uh, the drought as well. So uh, like I said, there's no drought right now, but 20 years, 30 years, it will come. It's the, it's the matter of how do you share the drought as well. Well, Dr. Sudan was hugely affected by flooding at many times in the last years. Can the Grand Ethiopia Wellness and Sudan or the GERD project can mitigate the flooding problem for Sudan? Yes, in fact, this is one of the biggest advantage uh, for Sudan, as I mentioned uh, on that economic study that shows one to two billion uh, increase in GDP every year from now for you know 40 years didn't include the impact of flood. Um, last year we know it was a once in a hundred years basically event, uh, and it it will be a story. Uh, it will be history once we have guard in place. In fact, my partner and myself, uh, we have done some some studies that's almost uh, finished, uh, but that shows that even under a normal Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam operations. So when you say normal, it, uh, the plan is to operate it between 49 billion cubic meter to full. So that's basically from 625 meter to uh, uh, 640. So even under a normal operations, you would have a lower uh, storage or you have more space in GERD before the rainy season. And if it was online last year, it would have completely completely avoided uh, some of the you know, devast devastation uh, that we saw uh, last year. Definitely, this is one of uh, the biggest advantage for them as well, in addition to the others that uh, I mentioned earlier. Well, the Sudanese people have never went to a trip by flood anymore, but the Sudanese officials are now making a statement against the people interest. Why this? I, I don't know. I mean, this, 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 is, uh, this is not science, so I, I really don't know in terms of answering these specific questions. Uh, I am struggling to answer um, the Sudan's position. Uh, it seems to be shifting for the last year or so. Uh, some of the advantage that has been uh, reflected, as I mentioned, these are some of their own studies. Um, I have, we invited, uh, as part of We Aspire, for example, in our group, we have invited many Sudanese professionals as well. And what we uh, see is that there isn't really technical related issue that Sudan can raise that has not been already addressed. Uh, so again, this, 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 is, this is something I cannot explain in, <laughs> from scientific perspective. Well, Ethiopia is on the way to fill the second water filling operation in the coming Ethiopian summer season. Can Ethiopia do that without reaching an agreement with the negotiators, which means Sudan and Egypt? Uh, Ethiopia will, will do this. And uh, as was mentioned, that with or without negotiation is going to uh, be filled. The reason is not because Ethiopia is, you know, trying to act like a bully uh, or, or something, you know, I don't care or something like that. No, this is something they have already agreed in the 2015 de uh, Declaration of Principle. And this is the way the dam is constructed. So the moment you raise the central block, uh, the only way now to uh, let water is through the bottom outlet. Uh, some of the, your audience may have seen uh, the fully uh, operational uh, pictures and videos of how the bottom outlet was, uh, you know, operated. Uh, that's by design. Uh, so what, what's going to happen is once the bottom outlet uh, become functional, then the central block will be dried up and then will be raised by 30 meters. And then after that in summer, 
we will get a lot of rain. We expect a lot of rain and stream flows. Uh, there will be more water coming in to the dam site than that can get out through the bottom outlet, basically. So um, there is no way for Ethiopia not to hold water. So this is part of the construction. The only way you cannot hold the water is if you stop the construction of the, the dam, which is not. Uh, so I think that that's, this is already agreed. This is part of the, in fact, what makes it a sm smart uh, design because you don't w want to finish all the dam, uh, all the construction and then start to filling. Uh, and since this dam is, is, is big, uh, you can't just fill it like that. It would be impacting a lot more uh, to downstream countries. The other, what they, they said is they agreed on how to come smart way of designing it in such a way as you continue to construct, you hold more and more water. And that's where we are uh, today. Uh, so once they reach to uh, the, the levels and the bottom outlet become functional, it's already been functional, then you will have uh, water that will, be, um, uh, that, that will be held behind the dam. Well, again, Sudan is worrying about the safety of the dam. What kind of safety work should be undertaken before the second water filling uh, is taking place? As one expert, what is your advice? Um, Sudan have raised uh, this safety issue in the past, and I believe that's the answer. So there is a couple of things bundled here. One of, the, one of them is the safety of the structure itself. Uh, I think this was raised a long time ago and has been addressed. So basically that the, safe, the, the dam is safe to hold water and to stay as such. Uh, but the other uh, part that Sudan was raising is the safety from the perspective of how it would handle when Ethiopia release water downstream because their dam is, is smaller than us. In fact, the closest is about one tenth of the guard. Uh, so a typical summer operation, not now, once you fill the dam, a typical summer operation during uh, the GERD, after it's filled and start to generate water, you can expect easily, you know, 13, 14 billion cubic meter going, uh, you know, in a month or a month and a half. And that's a lot of water for, for Sudan. So there has to be a coordination there has to be data exchange. There has to be exchange of information that tells Sudan, hey, this is what's our expectation. The next one, two months, this is how we, or the next year, how we are going to operate. This is the expectation of how much water it comes your way. So that is where the safety uh, 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 issue is, is being solved. Uh, I understand that in terms of the, the second feeling, uh, the Ethiopian government has offered them already, I think, in terms of how much uh, water goes downstream and so on. But the main issue is not now. The main issue is after GERD is complete and it's full, how does a summer operation may impact them because Ethiopia has to release quite a bit of water and generate a lot during uh, the summer time. That I think, uh, as far as I know, they have already agreed to, to exchange data, uh, reciprocal uh, information, not only with Sudan, also with Egypt. Uh, that's the way to address it. Well, do the three countries, Ethiopia, Sudan, and Egypt, uh, I need to more mediators to get a solution to reach an agreement. No, I don't believe so. Um, the um, African Union is perfectly capable of facilitating. And don't forget, we still have uh, observers from uh, the EU, United States, South Africa. Uh, and, and if the parties, meaning Sudan, Ethiopia, and, and Egypt, want opinion, or a consultation, uh, you know, such as other international experience. I just mentioned about what's going on uh, in Colorado River. In fact, this is a great example that they should use in terms of their water allocation and how they share uh, the drought as well. So if you have a question in terms of international experience or others, they, you have these observers to, to help you understand, uh, you know, what, whatever question you have, but bringing actively another mediators and trying to convince uh, one or the other doesn't seem to me it's going to work because the underlying issue, the big problem they have right now is the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance uh, Dam is being used as a water sharing 
allocation, and that allocation is zero for now as it stands for Ethiopia. So whether you bring one, two, 10, 100 med mediators you can bring, how are you going to convince a country who produced 86% of the total flow should uh, have zero what are alloc allocated to it? So to me, bringing more mediators, uh, it's not gonna help at all. It's, it's just the underlying issue, the three countries for the betterment of their all people um, should solve this by themselves and recognize that everyone has a right to use uh, uh, some part of the water. Ethiopia is not saying that I'm going to take the whole water. Uh, Ethiopia is saying my share should not be zero. And there is no uh, international law that I know uh, that says, you know, you, you, you produce 86% and your share is zero. So uh, that's because of the underlying issue is what are allocation? Um, I, I don't think bringing any other mediator is going to help you at all. I don't think so. Well, Sudan has been changing its stand from time to time by siding for Egypt rather than siding for truth. Why is this happening? That's a, that's a big question. I, I guess this is, uh, they can better answer this. Uh, what I can tell you from my, my perspective as someone follow this closely, uh, I have seen significant change in terms of uh, the Sudanese approach. Um, it's, it's a puzzle for me. Uh, it's not something I can explain through science. I can give you an example. Uh, last year, uh, because of the flood, what has been said in the media, not just only ordinary Sudanese people, but their officials, uh, their, their engineers, all of them uh, are in the record saying, that if the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam was in operation today, if it was today, it, uh, it was in operation today, we wouldn't be suffering this. So just alone from the flood, uh, benefit they get is tremendous. Uh, and we talked about the economy uh, situation. Now, this year, I heard that they had a few days or so, uh, some water uh, shortage issue or something like that, uh, which doesn't make sense because we, uh, we actually looked at the data. Uh, Sudan was ready to, to sign in terms of the minimum flow that can pass through uh, the GERD at 50 million cubic meter per day. This is a minimum flow, basically uh, at, at lower levels. If you go historically, it will happen sometime in, during the, the drought. In fact, it will be less than that during uh, the dry season. Um, during the first filling, uh, the amount of water that was passing to Sudan was more than twice. Uh, then you, you wonder, now you are, you are hearing that you know, there was some issues uh, in terms of water supply, while they were getting more than 100 uh, million cubic per uh, meter per day, uh, it's, it's a puzzle for me. So I cannot really explain uh, why the, the Sudanese position is changing from last year to this year. I can only give you an example of what's going on. There isn't anything that changed. Uh, everything uh, we are today is known last year. Every benefit of the, the dam, uh, that was it last year, it's still here. Uh, it's just the perception uh, that has changed as far, as far as I can, I can tell. Ethiopia have expressed uh, us having a, a strong stand by the African Union-led negotiation, but both Egypt and Sudan uh, failed to do so. What, what is this? What, why, why is this and what is behind their interest? Uh, the African Union is able and capable to uh, bring these countries together and uh, get to some solution. Um, I think it should be encouraged uh, by other, uh, you know, international organizations as well. Like I said, there are observers as well. Um, it looks to me that uh, the issue, again, goes back to the water allocation and, and uh, you know, how do you, um, how do you use water? So as it stands, um, what they are offering Ethiopia is that there is no any possibility of in the future using any type of water consumption whether it's for drinking or for agriculture upstream of the, uh, the GERD, which makes no sense. Um, uh, I have done some research in terms of, simply in terms of the water supply uh, for Nile Basin countries, including Ethiopia. Uh, the water supply alone, 
uh, probably quadruple from where we are today to uh, 2050. So the idea that uh, Ethiopia will not even use anything for water supply for people to drink in the future uh, make no sense. So Ethiopia continue to say that, you know, AU, uh, the African Union should be able to um, uh, facilitate this for so that we can come together into something use, useful as well as win-win situation for us. Uh, on the other hand, um, others, they don't seem to, to believe on that. So uh, I guess going back to uh, what we just said that, uh, you know, having other people trying to solve things that mathematically doesn't make sense. Uh, I don't know how you do it. It's, it's, it's almost impossible. You produce so much. Uh, there, there is enough water, by the way, in the Nile Basin. There is enough water for everyone, uh, probably from today, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, but in the future, obviously, 50 years from now, because of the population growth and, and some other stress in the system, the Nile Basin, you may be short because there are more people. Uh, so in that, uh, for that time, you have to figure out how, how you can use the water efficiently. So you have to do more demand and supply side measures, as we call them, not just only from supply side. That's what they are talking about today. They have to look at from the demand side as well. How can you use the water efficiently? Uh, so they can do that to take care of the future uh, water allocation. But today, there is enough water. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know why, why they want to take it somewhere else. Well, in nutshell, in nutshell, what is the future fate of the quality of our water dam governor position? I think they have to go back to the negotiating table. Uh, there is, uh, there is no other way forward than than it. Uh, I think uh, they should take a district, uh, discrete steps, uh, something achievable. Uh, there is a, a saying that even you know, with our engineering or any other field, when you have a complex problem, uh, how you solve that is not trying to solve the entire problem as one shot. So you try, you try to break it apart, solve uh, part of it, and move forward. This is a very complex uh, issue. And as I said, the water allocation is being bundled into the GER negotiation. So the moment you do that, I don't know how they can uh, avoid that. That's why all these scenario drought, extended drought and so on is basically about water allocation. So what they should do and what could be done is that go back to the negotiating table and agree for some filling, which they can do now. Uh, filling the dam, we are in excellent hydrologic condition, as I said. Um, so agree on that. Once you finish that, then work on how you allocate water equitably and reasonably for everyone. <laughs> I think that's what the international law says. Uh, so once you, you have that, you also put, don't forget, if things change in the future, you have to have this dynamic agreement that you will be able to change as things progress. If climate change and makes it things worse, you share the drought. If, it, if climate change, uh, you know, make more water, but is variable, then build more dam, store that, and you can share. Uh, so that's the only way I can see it. So break apart this complex problem uh, on, a, on and as a pieces that you can, you know, at least, hey, we got some result and, you know, cheers and move on. Uh, that will build also uh, confidence. So if you agree with something small, and everybody's okay, and then that will build comp, uh, confidence, and then that will help you to tackle even a bigger issue uh, like the water allocation as well. Well, as the girl is a salt finance, what is expected from all Ethiopians living in the country and outside of the country in supporting the dam to uh, source to complete in, this, in uh, the timetable that is provided for the project? What is expected from all? Yes, I think there is a lot of movement right now to, uh, you know, to help the, the GERD finish, not only the, the diaspora, but also uh, in Ethiopia. And I think this is worth mentioning that uh, a lot of people from, you know, all the way people poor or as teachers or others in Ethiopia, all of them, uh, they literally put their uh, sweat equity on this. So they literally put their, their money on the line. 
so I think that's why, and we know all the history of why we were not able to, to do that before. That's a different story. But for now, I think what's left is almost there. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's 79 or so, 80% complete. Uh, so this, uh, you know, the, the remaining 20% uh, should be, you know, should be done in a timely fa fashion. And for that, uh, both the, the diaspora, which is outside, as well as the Ethiopian people have been doing uh, great on that. So they have to continue to do that. Um, if it's not for us, who, who, who else? Uh, I think that's, that's the message and people have taken this uh, um, you know, seriously and as they should. So I think that will continue uh, as far as I can see it. Well, Dr. Trousseau, I'm done with all my questions. Thank you very much for your time and positive thoughts. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for having me as well. Well, dear viewers, this will bring us to the end of this edition. Till the next edition, have a wonderful.